Make sure make sure you mute so. Hey guys, I'll give just a minute more for some joining. I apologize about being too late. Okay, all right, I'm gonna get started. We'll see if anybody else can join up with us as we go. Um, wanted to do a little bit more um, what I consider uh, case-oriented uh, talk today. Talk a little bit about error preservation, Rule 59 and Rule 60. Uh, these are all super important for you guys doing trials and trial work. And when I look around on this screen, just about all of you are gonna be spending some time in trials. So uh, knowing that, um, you're soon going to be dealing on some level with appeals uh, and what to do when trials go wrong. Uh, now, generally speaking, uh, when, when you are, are going through trial, you are going to be thinking about all the things we talk about in our trial talks. Uh, and that is that you're going to know your case, you're going to have a, a very brief theme, that you're going to be able to explain that to a judge that you're gonna be able to win in the back um, of, of the, um, uh, in, in judicial, in chambers or wherever that might be. So you're not in that situation of, um, you know, stressing out in terms of your trial. Uh, we talked a little bit about objections and things like that that you might make in trials. Uh, and um, of course, um, where that strategy is in terms of your opening, your closing, and, and just your overall case strategy. But one of the things I think that we tend to forget about when we're dealing with trials is that in that trial, you have different audiences. Your first audience is your client. I mean, you want some of the things that you're going to do in trial are solely for your client. Your client needs to hear it. Your client needs to hear that their arguments are being posted, that they're being explained in those things. The second one is, of course, the judge. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and that can include the jury. But there is a third one we don't talk about that much, and that is the Court of Appeals or your appellate, um, your appellate uh, um, review. And this does happen more than you think. Uh, and there's a couple of different times where it does come up and you want to be able to deal with it pretty quickly. So, um, you know, starting with that, I think the very first thing to talk about is your error, error preservation strategy. Um, now, one of the um, issues that we have in terms of our trials are that the judges that, that are running our trials have strong feelings about the case. Most of the time, uh, whether you're in North or South Carolina, you're dealing with a child custody case, you're dealing with a family law case, you're dealing with something that the judge has already got some predisposition or some thoughts about what that case is going to be or what it's going to come to. And quite frankly, a lot of those judges are not going to let the rules of evidence get in the way of hearing the case that they want to hear. Uh, Mellon and I um, just got finished uh, doing a hearing and then we went over to the Rutherford County courtroom and got to see just a briefly some jury trial. And it was interesting just to see how uh, Judge Bell from um, Charlotte was ruling on the motions as a criminal case with the public defender's office and just get to hear a little bit about what, uh, how the judge was ruling on their evidentiary motions. And was really allowing some things in that I'm not sure uh, that should have come into to the trial. Like, well, uh, go ahead, I'll hear that, whatever it is. It, it's hard to know for sure when you're just watching the trial as to why a judge may allow evidence in and not, because there are some issues in pretrial and things like that that might have some impact on it. But for the most part, um, these are were you know evidence was coming in that I thought think. At least it was somewhat questionable whether or not that evidence should have come in. It was things about what a child might have been feeling and some things like that. Like, but why is that coming in? The problem is, is when a judge lets something in, you have to make a decision. Okay, do I object to it or not? Most of the time, you guys are going to say objection. And 
most of the time, whether I'm in North or South Carolina, when we say objection, that's all the judge wants to hear. The judge doesn't want to hear objection hearsay, doesn't want to hear objection assumes facts, not in evidence. Uh, uh, objection multiple. Now, there are times in which I will go ahead and say that. I will say, Your Honor, objection on this. Um, Gabby and I right now are dealing with an appeal. Uh, and there was an evidentiary issue uh, involved in it of whether or not an expert was going to be able to testify as to a line of uh, of issues. And, uh, you know, when this happens, the judge was allowing us to go pretty far towards the line, but then a line got drawn and said, you're not going to go any further than that. So what you have to do in um, in the trial, even though you have everything going on, you have a client beside you that's stressed out. You're dealing with a judge, but you're making a record. You have to make an objection at that point. Now, the judge may say overruled or I'm not, you know, or sustained or whatever it might be. You have to be able to identify as to why you are making that objection. And you have to be able to do that without making the judge mad or pissed off because you want to win at the trial court level. You don't want to create a problem. It is fine to say, Your Honor, objection, I would like to be heard. And I've never heard a judge deny that request. So if you say objection, want to be heard on that, um, then you, know, you can say it's hearsay, but it's also statutorily not allowed because let's say if it's um, one of our PI cases, uh, you know, Blake might be like, objection, Your Honor, that goes to insurance issue or whatever that might be. 